apologies for those who are trying to get the uh, early part of the uh, Facebook message. I just realized that uh, we're on uh, mute there. Uh, we are uh, reading from Mark's Gospel in chapter 15, uh, and uh, we're reading, uh, we've got down to verse number 14. Then Pilate said unto them, Why? What evil hath he done? And they cried out the more exceedingly, Crucify him. And so Pilate, willing to content the people, released Barabbas unto them and delivered Jesus when he had scourged him to be crucified. And the soldiers led him away into the hall called Praetorium, and they called together the whole band, and they clothed him with purple and plaited a crown of thorns and put it upon his head, they began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews. They smote him on the head with a reed and did spit upon him, and bowing their knees, worshipped him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple from him and put his own clothes on him and led him out to crucify him. And they compelled one, Simon a Cyrenian, who passed by, coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. And they bring him unto the place Golgotha, which is being interpreted the place of a scot. And they gave him to drink wine mingled with myrrh, but he received it not. And when they had crucified him, they parted his garments, casting lots upon them, what every man should take. It was the third hour, and they crucified him. And the superscription of his accusation was written over, the king of the Jews. And with him they crucified two thieves, the one on his right hand and the other on his left. And the scripture was fulfilled which said, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And though the passed by railed on him, wagging their heads and saying, Ah, thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself and come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests, mocking, said among themselves with the scribes, He saved others. Himself he cannot save. Let Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross, that we may see and believe. And they that were crucified with him, reviled him. But it's God to bless his word to us as we consider uh, this solemn passage uh, of scripture together. In chapter 15, we're really reaching the culmination of the second part of the ministry of the perfect servant. Back in chapter 8, verses 27 to 30, the Lord Jesus asks his disciples what men think about him. And in the answers that the disciples give, it is evident that the people have not, in general, have not recognized him as the Messiah, the one who had come to rule over Israel. And so from that point onwards, the Lord Jesus begins preparing his disciples for the fact that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. In chapter 10, he has told them that the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. And it is really from the end of chapter 8 that the Lord Jesus has had his gaze now towards the cross. And as we come to chapter 15, uh, we reach the culmination, the pinnacle of this aspect of his service. Now, in characteristic uh, style, Mark does not really dwell too long on any aspect. Uh, we've seen throughout this book uh, that he moves on at a pace. And here Mark does, uh, doesn't really do a great deal more uh, than simply record the historic event of the death of Jesus of Nazareth. In verses uh, 1 to 5, we're going to just consider the silence of the servant. The silence of the servant. And Mark is focusing, as we've mentioned before in this gospel, upon the servant character of the Lord Jesus. And it's very interesting that throughout the process 
that he has gone through with the trials with the high priest and the scribes and the Pharisees and the council, and then with Pilate. Uh, as far as I can tell, there was only two times that the Lord speaks. Uh, and those two times were in order to confirm a direct question uh, concerning who he was and concerning the truth of the claims that he had made. And so it's as though having submitted after the struggle in the garden, uh, after the uh, suffering uh, and the agony of the garden, the Lord Jesus, the perfect servant, he submits to the will of God and he only speaks by way of confirming uh, that which is needed concerning the truth of his person. And it seems to be very, very prominent in these first uh, five verses uh, that Pilate is amazed at the silence of the servant. Uh, we see him in verse uh, one. Uh, we have this council that is brought together. Uh, and we don't read of the Savior speaking there. Uh, we read of the confirmation that he gives in verse number two to the direct question that Pilate gives. But then after that, uh, we read of how he answered nothing in verse four. And in verse five, he still answers uh, nothing. In verse number one, we have the council. And isn't it sad? How that uh, any thoughts that they had had of uh, not taking Christ and crucifying him and seeking to get rid of him on the feast, feast day, uh, all of that has now gone from their minds. Having got the Lord Jesus, they're now focused on seeking to finish the job as quickly as they can. You know, haste is always a dangerous thing, isn't it? And here the chief priests and the whole council do not stop to consider, even on a human level, the complete injustice of what they are doing as they rush through the condemnation of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, it's interesting as we come through to the New Testament and the letters that are written to Christians, how that things like long suffering and patience and forbearance are qualities that the children of God should demonstrate. But after all, this is the kind of uh, attribute that God has himself. But here, sadly, with those who ought to have been representing God to the nation and indeed to the Gentiles, and yet they rush this thing through with no thought of any proper uh, trial. It's almost as though the trial the previous night that had been illegal, and so they bring the whole council together in a rush in order that they can ratify what is done and move on to the next part. And also probably in order to bring together a greater multitude uh, to put that pressure upon Pilate, because notice what it says, that they brought the whole council and bound Jesus and carried him away and delivered him to Pilate. And so now they've got a bigger group that can put the pressure on Pilate. I want you to notice the irony, though, that Mark records and delivered him to Pilate. It's as though uh, they were in control. They had bound Jesus and they were the ones delivering, delivering him up. But what had the Lord said in Mark chapter 10? He said, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be delivered unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles. The omniscient servant knew all along what was going on. And here men thinking that they were in control were really just demonstrating uh, that God's plan was being carried out and Christ was going as it had been said of him. So the Lord confirms his messiahship uh, in verse number two, but then he's silent. You know, there is a very real danger, isn't there, of saying too much. 
And we're all in danger of wanting to say too much at times. And it takes real wisdom, doesn't it? Real wisdom from the indwelling spirit of God to know when we should speak and when we should be silent. Peter would say to those in his first letter that we should be ready to give an answer. But the Lord says in the Sermon on the Mount that we should not give that which is holy unto the docks, neither cast ye your pearls before the swine. And so we need to ask God for that very real, real wisdom that the Lord demonstrated as to when we need to give an answer and when an answer will be received and considered or when actually those things that are holy and precious will simply just be trampled underfoot or twisted into more and more accusations and so desecrate the holiness of the things of which we speak. We see the accusations that are made uh, it says the chief priests accused him of many things. And it's interesting that Mark doesn't really focus upon the specifics of the accusations, but really emphasizes the amount of it. They accused him of many things in verse 3, and Pilate repeats in verse 4, Behold, how many things they witness against thee. You know, sometimes a multitude of words covers up uh, a, uh, a reality, doesn't it? Uh, and and uh, uh, covers up the inability to be able to demonstrate the truth of something. You know, sometimes it can be a dangerous thing uh, standing up here uh, that uh, if you're not too sure of things, you can cover it with a multitude of words and it sounds good. But actually when you unpick it, uh, you haven't actually said a lot. And it's so true that here they were, they had no reality to accuse the Lord Jesus of. And so they hide it in seeking to bring a multitude of things. How sad it was that they knowingly came and they accused him of things of which they could not uh, prove. And notice the astonishment of Pilate. He marveled. He must have seen many people accused, and he would have been used to their protestation of innocence. But here was the Lord Jesus standing out in his conduct as he always did. Now, Peter would take up the example of the Lord Jesus, and he would say uh, to those who were undergoing suffering that having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. Ultimately, the chief priests and the scribes will be brought to shame if it wasn't beforehand, then ultimately before the judgment seat of Christ, uh, the, the, the great white throne, as there they stand before Christ and their mouths will be shut as they are ashamed that they stood there and falsely accused Christ. May it be that our lives are such that we are blameless and men may accuse us of many things as they did the perfect sir. If they did it to Christ, uh, we can't expect to be treated any better than him. But may it be that we have a good conscience that they might speak evil, but actually none of those things can be upheld. It's interesting to note that in Pilate's first question, there seems to be a degree of astonishment, for he says, art thou the king of the Jews? Art thou the king of the Jews? And here was one standing before him so quiet and so mild, obviously not from any high family, uh, and it seems to be that there was a degree of astonishment that this was the one of which there was such a fuss. You know, true power doesn't always have to be on display, does it? And the Lord Jesus, and in many ways, the evidence of true power is the ability to be able to restrain it 
as well as to demonstrate it. And here the Lord Jesus, he restrains that power that he has. And Pilate is amazed that this is the one who is the king of the Jews. And so we see the silence of the servant. But then in verses 6 to 15, we see the cry of the crowd, the cry of the crowd. Number one, the cry was for the deliverance of a prisoner. Notice it says in verse number eight, and the multitude crying aloud began to desire him to do as he had ever done unto them. And so it seems that initially uh, the cry of the crowd uh, would have been a standard thing every Passover feast day. And that this was a precedent that had been set that he would allow a prisoner to be released. You know, I found it quite ironic that as the crowd and then ultimately the chief priests cried out for consistency in this leader, uh, that they were demonstrating complete inconsistency with their own laws and their own uh, work. But notice that they didn't cry out only for what had been done in the past, but they cried out for one who had committed murder in an insurrection. And again, notice the irony uh, and notice the blindness that sin causes. That here they were standing accusing Christ of treason, of insurrection against Caesar, saying that he claims himself to be a king. And yet all the while, they cry out for the release of one who had been convicted of insurrection and had actually taken life in that insurrection. You know, sin blinds us, doesn't it? As we, uh, as we commit sin, uh, we then seek to justify and cover up in order to make ourselves look okay. What a contrast in the choice that they had. They had a murderer on the one hand, or one who was the giver of life on the other. They had one who was an instigator of rebellion, or one who was there to bring about reconciliation with God. We had one who sought political power, one who had demonstrated the power of God in his life and in his acts. We had one who sought to do things in human strength and wisdom. But here was one who stood in all the humility and wisdom of God. How sad it was that as they cried for the deliverance of the prisoner, they cried out at the direction of the chief priests and of the scribes. You see, it was a prisoner that they desired that Pilate would release. Notice it says in verses 6 and verse 9, and that it was a prisoner whomsoever they desired. And Pilate would say, will ye that I release unto you uh, the king of the Jews? And so they knew that Pilate was bound by the fact that it was the prisoner that they desired that he would release unto them. And so the chief priests, they moved to stir up and excite the people to choose Barabbas. How solemn a thing that it was those who should have known and taught the people the way of God who were most instrumental in stirring up opposition. Justice was such an important part of the law that God had given himself, and they failed to uphold this. They cried out in response to Pilate's questions. Questions, by the way, which demonstrate Pilate's culpability in the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus. You know, sometimes uh, we can be tempted uh, to perhaps feel a little bit sorry for Pilate. Uh, but in many ways, he had brought his own catch-22 situation upon himself. In seeking to stand against Caesar and bringing himself into problems there, 
He tied himself into a corner when he was then accused of perhaps siding with one. He was setting himself against Pilate. And in the questions that he asks, he demonstrates his own culpability because in verses 9 and 10, he displayed his understanding of the situation. It says blatantly, will ye that I release unto you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priests had delivered him for envy. He well knew from his examination and from his observation that the Lord Jesus was not guilty of the things that they had accused him of. And he recognized in the chief priests and the elders that here was one who was a threat to their authority. And therefore, they were seeking a way of getting rid of uh, him. And so he displayed an understanding of the situation, well understanding the nature of political maneuvering. But of course, he was going to fall foul of that same political maneuvering as the uh, chief priest understood the vulnerable position that he, Pilate, was in in relation to those higher up in the Roman hierarchy. It's a question that sought to relieve himself of the responsibility. He says, what did the crowd wish him to do with the king of the Jews? He knew what he ought to do, and in many ways, the Lord Jesus shouldn't have been part of the choice. Because it was, what prisoner should I release to you? Which one that has been convicted of uh, a crime? Here was the Lord Jesus that Pilate had not been able to convict of a crime. The Lord Jesus shouldn't even have been part of the choice, but he seeks to pass over the responsibility by saying, what will ye then that I shall do unto him whom ye call the king of the Jews? And finally, he displays very clearly his understanding of the innocency of Jesus, for he says, why, what evil hath? He done. You know, to those who understand much, the scriptures warn will be required much as well. Pilate knew Christ's innocence and yet allowed the sentence still to fall upon him. You know, a solemn injustice was done, wasn't it? Very, very solemn injustice was done. But is it not a delightful picture? of the bigger work of Christ. But here is Barabbas, a convicted criminal, one who was guilty before the law. And yet he was released and Christ went and suffered what Barabbas deserved. Notice what uh, the word that is used for release is one that means to free fully. This was a complete deliverance from the sentence past. And what a lovely picture. That was Christ has gone to the cross for us. There has been a full release. Nothing held back. A complete deliverance from the sentence past. And so this crime was initially for a prisoner to be delivered. Then it was in response uh, to, uh, then it was motivated by the stirring up of the chief priests. Then it was in response to the questions Pilate had asked. And finally, it was a crime for crucifixion. Death alone was not sufficient. The death of the cross was what they designed. You see, this was going to be a spectacle. It would be an open triumph for the chief priests and the scribes. They well knew the shame that was linked with the hanging upon a cross. But the scriptures said in the Old Testament, cursed is everyone that hangs upon a tree. Surely this would be the final proof that they were right to do what they had done. For surely if Christ was really the son of God, then the father would not allow this terrible thing to happen and for the son of God to become a curse. It was a spectacle. And they knew that it would be a shame. But we know that the Father and the Son were working together to bring about the accomplishment of the work of God. You know, 
It's so sad as we come to verse number 15 uh, that Pilate not only did Pilate give in to their request, but he also chose to scourge the one whom he knew was innocent. And so in verses 16 to 20, we move on to the fact that he was now surrounded by soldiers. Mark 15, verse 16, and it says, And the soldiers led him away into the hall called Praetorium. You know, the description of the scenes that follow are remarkable in the lack of emotional language that is used. And the Gospels simply record the facts of what happened. And they don't seek to create any emotional response from those who are reading. But the point is this, is that they don't need to. For those who read it thinkingly and those who read it carefully and consider what is going on, cannot help but be affected by what they see. You know, this is another scene that demonstrates plainly the sinfulness of men as these soldiers gather to mock their victim. Notice, first of all, the multitude. It says, and they call together the whole band, the whole band. Now, a Roman legion, uh, as I understand it, was somewhere between four and 6,000 men. And a band was a tenth of that number. So when it says that the whole band was brought together, it's describing a company of perhaps four to 600 men. Can you imagine the scene? But here is the Saviour alone and surrounded by these soldiers of about four to 600. You know how powerful men feel themselves when they have an advantage like this. How much they would take advantage of the situation. The multitude, four to 600 men, notice the mocking. They had caught hold of the title King of the Jews and thus they mock his claim. And they give him a mock coronation. You're the king of the Jews, they say. Well, we give you a robe. They give him a robe of purple. You're a king, and so we give you a crown of thorns. And they plait a crown of thorns and put it upon his head. Are you a king? Well, we salute you then, and we bow the knee. And they bow the knee in mocking. You're a king, so we give you a scepter. And they give him a reed, but then they use that same reed to smite him upon the head. You know, this man, the Lord Jesus, he remains standing in dignified silence. And as men would do their works, and as men would mock the Lord Jesus, commits all to him that judges righteousness. We quoted in the breaking of bread this morning that uh, verse from Isaiah 53. As a sheep before her shearers is done, so he openeth not his mouth. Here is the perfect servant in wonderful submission to the Father's will, willing to bear such mockery at the hand of those whom he had created. You know, it's interesting that the word for crown, as they plait that crown of thorns upon his head, is the word for a victor's crown. And they perhaps did it in mocking. But we know that here was the Lord Jesus, victorious, even before he went to the cross, because the outcome of the work that he was going to do was utterly and completely secure. What was going through the mind of the Lord at that time, we do not know. Was it the day when every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord? Was it the joy that was set before him that he was prepared to despise the shame and endure the suffering? Whatever it was that he thought, the book of Hebrews asks us to consider him 
to consider him, to stop and to focus and to consider, to think about him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. Why? Lest ye be weary and faint in your minds. You know, speaking for myself, it's easy to get disheartened when there's just a little bit of opposition. When there's a little bit of mocking, let alone any physical violence. And the writer to the Hebrew says this, one of the things that, one of the reasons why these things are recorded is so that we consider, lest we be wearied and faint in our minds. May it be that we take encouragement and we are stirred up to stand for Christ as we just consider something of the mocking and the shame and the suffering that he endured. And let us remember that he is the king. He is the king who is crowned with glory and honor. He is the king who in a coming day will come with his vesture dipped in the blood of his enemies. He is the one who will destroy with the brightness of his coming. He is the one who will come with the sword from his mouth. And the one who is so silent now will destroy with just a word. He will be the one who is the judge of all. He is the one before whom these ones will have to stand if they had not repented and saved and being saved in the days uh, following. Verses 21 to 25, we have Christ crucified. We have the path to the cross in verse 21. And they compel one Simon of Cyrenian who passed by, coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. We're not told here why uh, Simon was compelled to carry, but elsewhere we understand that there was a very real physical weakness that had been caused by the scourging, by the suffering that the Lord had already gone through. You know, the Lord was a very real man. And the suffering was very real to him. Notice the impact that it had on at least one of the sons of uh, Simon of Cyrene. In Romans 16, verse 13, it says this, Salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and Mind. And there seems to be uh, some uh, connection, perhaps, uh, with uh, this here, that Rufus uh, was one who was touched by what went on at this particular event. So the path of the cross, Simon is compelled to carry. The place of the cross is a place called Golgotha, so named uh, the place of the skull. Perhaps because of the impression the physical place caused when looked at, or possibly because of the result of the gruesome things uh, that went on there uh, time and time again. Notice the palliative that was given at the cross. They offered wine mingled with myrrh, but he would not take it. And that which would have perhaps dulled the pain and dulled the senses to a little degree, the Lord was not going to take any of it. He was going into the cross with his senses absolutely clear, crystal clear, uh, so that uh, he knew exactly the time, exactly the moments. But he ought to commend his spirit into the Father's hand, that he would know that the scriptures would say that on the cross, the suffering servant would say, I thirst. And so that he would bear in its entirety the judgment of God against the sin of the world. Notice the parting of the garments, how typical of the callousness of men that at such a time they could only think of personal gain. And what a lovely contrast with the one who was there upon the cross, who though he was rich, yet for our sakes, he became poor that we through his poverty might be rich. Notice the passing of time. We're told that it was the third hour that they crucified him. And when we come to 1 Corinthians in chapter 1, notice the power of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 would tell us this, that that which was viewed as shameful and bearing a curse was what would form the center of the preaching of the apostles. For Paul would say that the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. 
We preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them that are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. That which men saw as shameful, uh, that which men saw as the epitome of shame and the depths to which a person could go is the very thing that God uses to bring about the salvation of men and women. That which was classed as a stumbling block for the Jews and foolishness for the Greeks is the very thing that we have come to see is the very power and wisdom of God. Verses 26 to 32, notice the superscription, the scriptures and the score. In verse number uh, 26, it says, and the superscription of his accusation was written over the king of the Jews. Now, this was put up by Pilate, and I would imagine that it was put up and was written like that uh, by way of Pilate mocking uh, the chief priests and the uh, Jewish people. It was protested by the Jews, we read of in another gospel. And no doubt because it stood in condemnation of their action. But here upon the cross was indeed the king of the Jews that they were rejecting. And all the while that they stood at the bottom of the cross, the accusation was there against them. That they had rejected the Messiah that God had given to them. Notice the scripture, Mark records how that in Isaiah 53 verse 12, that the scriptures were fulfilled, that the thieves were crucified on either side, and that he was numbered with the transgressors. Again, how sad to see that those who said that they knew the scriptures failed to see how many of the things of the Old Testament were being fulfilled in just that short time. John would remind us that the scriptures had said that they would part his garments there at the bottom of the cross that his hands and his feet would be pierced. So many things the scriptures brought before them. And what a comfort and an encouragement to us as we look at the Old Testament and we see that it's the word of God. The prophecies that were made came to pass in and through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. So many coming together in one person and in just such a short amount of time, such a demonstration of the authority of the Old Testament scriptures. Notice the scorn. It says that they that passed by railed on him. That is, they blasphemed him. They defamed him. They treated him as of no account. How sad it is that those who had watched him and had listened to him, they had seen the magnificent miracles that he had done. They had heard the gracious words that he had spoken. And yet now they trample him underfoot by the things that they say. And they mock him. They wipe their heads and they say, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself and come down from the cross. You know, it's remarkable that it's the ordinary person that brings this accusation up against him. Uh, uh, and now, I guess it's perhaps because of the startling nature of it that when the Lord Jesus had said, I destroy this temple and I'm going to build it up again in three days, it was a kind of strange thing to say. And it was startling as well. And, and it seems to have stuck in the ordinary person's mind. And the force of the statement seems to be that you said you had power to do something remarkable like that. Well, if you have such power, surely you can come down from the cross. So they mock him and they defame him. Of course, the irony of it is, is that in order to actually accomplish what he was talking about, he couldn't come down from the cross because he was talking about his body that would enter into death and he would prove that he did have power to build it up again. For on the third day, he would rise again. The chief priests, they joined the mocking, the ideas that Jerry. Uh, along with the scribes, how sad to see uh, these chief men demeaning themselves 
to the place where they're, they're at the foot of the cross and they're jeering at one who is suffering. And they say, he saved others. He saved others. How true that statement was. I once heard a brother speaking in the gospel meeting on this little phrase of three words. He saved others. And how the Lord saved others. And it's delightful to trace through the salvation of the Lord for others. Of course, the challenge that the gospel preacher made, the application was, has he saved you? How sad it was that here the chief priests could say he saved others. There they were standing completely uh, unsaved, if we can use that expression. Completely far away from any salvation that Christ would offer uh, to them. They would say himself, he cannot save. You know, this was true in the sense that he had submitted himself to the Father's will so that he would not come down from the cross. It's not a fact that the power of Christ meant that, uh, that the power of Christ meant that he would have been able to step off of that cross and destroy all of those just in a simple word. But it was true himself he cannot say because he had determined to submit to the Father's will and the cross was the way that the Father had set out for him. And so in that sense, what they said was true. Himself, he cannot save. Why? Because the Father's will was that he might save you and I. They would say, let Christ, the King of Israel, descend that we may see and believe. You know how blind men are? They're, they're, they're saying, just give us this one extra sign. If we see this sign, then we believe. We will believe. Amen. Just, just, just take us down. Just come down from the cross. How blind they were. Christ had given them sign after sign after sign after sign. And yet they would not believe. And of course, the sign that he had given them meant that he had to die. Christ had said, uh, I'm not going to give you any other signs apart from the sign of Jonah, who went into the belly of the fish for three days and three nights and then came back. And so the Lord is about to accomplish the sign that he had given to them. But how sad it was that they were so blind that they would not take and believe the signs that Christ had given to them. You know, it's sad to see, isn't it, that even those who were suffering alongside him would take out their anger and their pain upon the one, upon the centre cross. But why? Why do we have the record of the fact that Christ suffered in all of these ways? Why was it that Christ would have to go this tortured way to the cross where he was tortured and he suffered so much why couldn't it just have been a simple and quick death well surely uh, the important thing was was that a sacrifice was made why 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 did he have to go through all of this I think there's at least two reasons. Peter would give us one of them in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. For here as we, are, uh, here as we have focused upon the physical suffering that the Lord endured, Peter would say this, for even hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. God knew that as he would call a people for himself, they would be called in a world of opposition against God, that God's children would be called to suffer in a great degree physically. And therefore, the captain of their salvation would go through the way of suffering before them in bringing many sons to glory. 
And why would he do that? It is so that we have an example to follow. An example to follow. And so Peter, as he speaks to those that he writes to, he would remind them of the perfection of the Lord Jesus in the way that he suffered. He would say, this is the one who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but had committed himself to him that judges righteously. Earlier on, he has spoken of the fact uh, that um, what glory is it if when you be buffeted for your faults, you shall take it patiently. But if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable unto God. And just as Christ endured patiently the sufferings of Christ, uh, Christ endured uh, the sufferings that he went through. So we will be called to suffer in many different ways. And in going to the cross, the Lord suffered mentally. The Lord suffered spiritually. The Lord suffered emotionally. To depths that we will never plumb. And thus it is that we have an example to follow. But also that we might know what divine love looks like. You see, we are going to be called to walk in love, Ephesians says, even as Christ offered himself as a sacrifice. And so now we are, have, we are having a very practical demonstration of what divine love looks like. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives. For the brethren. And God knew that he was going to call a people to himself, of which divine love should be a characteristic. And he left us an example of what that looks like. But finally, sorry, there's three reasons, not two reasons. So that we might know that there is one to whom we can go in all the suffering and pain of this life. Now, back in the Old Testament, uh, the high priests were taken from amongst men. And why were they taken from amongst men? It was in order that they might have sympathy and compassion upon their fellow human beings. And so we read in Hebrews chapter 5, for every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God that he might offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins, for who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. Here is the Lord in a very real way, suffering all the pain and all the weakness that the scourging and the crucifixion has placed upon him so that he might have compassion, so that he might be able to sympathize. It says in verse number seven, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things that he suffered. And being made perfect or complete, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him, called of God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. You see, in order for the Son of God to become the perfect high priest, he had to enter in experimentally to what suffering entailed. He had to enter experimentally into what obedience would bring about. And here at the cross, we've seen something of the depths of the physical, emotional experience of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we can be confident that when we go through those things as well, there is one that we can go to for sympathy, for comfort, 
and above all for strength to endure. You see, these things were not just pointless, but they were all part of the great plan that God had, not just for your and I salvation, but for your and I experimental walking with him in a world of suffering. We have a saviour. We have the son of God who is there at the throne of grace to where we can come to find grace and help in time of need. May we not only just be touched by the sufferings of the saviour as we view them through the lens of the gospels, but may we also be encouraged that he did it for our good, for our blessing and for our encouragement as well. Our Father, we're thankful. Our Father, we are just humbled as we consider that the Lord Jesus went through these things for us. And our God, we just worship before thee. And we adore our Saviour because of the fact that he was willing to do this. Because of the fact that he did not have to be forced to go but that he was willing to come. And our God, we give thanks that we have a high priest now seated at thy right hand, who knows all the sufferings of life. One who has endured and one who has triumphed. But God, we pray that we might be encouraged to go to him more. When the difficulties come, we are not seeking our own strength to overcome, but we would consider him who endured such contradiction of sins, so that we might not be wearied and faint in our mind, and that we might be driven to go to the throne of grace, to find grace and help in time of need. Our God, encourage us this week, we pray, that know us what lies ahead. Our Father, we pray for those of thy people around the world who will be suffering so much this week. We pray that you would bring home to them the fact that they have a saviour who sympathises, and our high priest who can supply their every need. Go with us, we pray, as we give our thanks in the Saviour's name.